If you are joining us today, we are so excited to have Dr. Tarnopolsky here with us today for a monthly expert series. Today, we will be discussing aging with Mito. My name is Stephanie Harry, and I'm one of the patient support coordinators here at Mito Action and will be your host for this afternoon. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on Mito Action's website in the coming days, as well as on our podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature at the bottom menu bar of your screen. If you're calling in via phone, feel free to submit your questions to us by email at info at mitoaction.org. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. Aging affects all of our mitochondria, but for those with mitochondrial disease, it's important to understand how our mitochondria change as we age. Today, Dr. Ternopolsky will address important questions like what happens to mitochondria as we age and how does that relate to muscle weakness and fatigue? How does endurance and resistance exercise training lead to improvements in mitochondria and clinical functioning? Can exercise help more than just muscles and the heart? And what do the studies show regarding exercise training for adult mitochondrial disease patients? Dr. Ternopolsky is a neuromuscular and neurometabolic clinician scientist who received an MD and PhD cell biology and metabolism from McMaster University. He currently holds an endowed chair from McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation in the area of neuromuscular and neurometabolic genetic disorders and follows over 500 patients with primary mitochondrial disorders. He's published over 500 peer-reviewed papers and has an H index of 138. His research focuses on pharmacological, nutraceutical, and exercise therapies for neuromuscular and neurometabolic disorders, aging, obesity, and other disorders that affect the mitochondria and muscle function. He is also the founder, CEO, and CSO of Exerkine Corporation, which is a biotech nutraceutical company developing therapies for aging, obesity, muscular dystrophy, and mitochondrial disorders. Dr. Ternopolsky, your lifelong commitment to our community and research is absolutely amazing. And we are so honored to have you here today to teach us. Thank you so much for your willingness to share all of your wisdom with us. Well, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. I'm going to just flip the screen here. Good. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. Yeah, good. Excellent. Uh, so again, thank you very much for the kind introduction. We are going to talk today about aging and mitochondrial disease. And um, you know who I am, Mark Chernopolsky. I'm a professor at McMaster University in Pediatrics and Medicine. So from a disclosure perspective, I have received some speaker honoraria from several companies. Um, and I am on the uh, ad board, which oh, unfortunately didn't get on here. I, I'm sorry. Uh, for a mitochondrial uh, study that's uh, going on right now. Um, I'm involved in uh, the uh, scientific um, um, uh, board with respect to uh, any side effects. Uh, so it's called the Data Safety Monitoring Board for those of you who might be uh, familiar with that. And that's for Reneo Therapeutics. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Exerkine and Stay Above Nutrition. Um, we've um, been working for 30 years in the area of mitochondrial disease and muscular dystrophy. Uh, we've generally used aging um, and athletes to try and uh, understand molecular biology and adaptations and to see how different interventions can improve mitochondrial function so that we can then apply it to our patients. We've done quite a few studies um, uh, in mitochondrial disease patients as well when we learn from you know, our aging uh, adults, which you'll learn more about today, uh, and from exercise physiology, we're trying to apply that to our patients. And uh, some of the stuff we learn from our patients, we apply back to people with aging. Uh, we do have uh, some uh, products which are targeted for the older adult. Um, I'll mention uh, briefly a couple of them here. Uh, there's likely value in mitochondrial disease. Um, we do, of course, in our um, uh, company, uh, focus on trying to make some money in uh, older adults um, and people with obesity. And then we have discount codes for our patients so that we don't make any profit at all from people with muscular dystrophy or mitochondrial disease. Uh, and so all of our patients have discount codes if they choose to purchase anything, just from a disclosure perspective. So I'm going to talk about uh, human aging. Um, now, uh, every human being in the world has mitochondrial disease, uh, which is aging, and aging affects the mitochondria. So if you already have a mitochondrial disorder, uh, aging is just you know gasoline on the fire, for lack of a better term. So for example, with chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, which is a sporadic mitochondrial DNA deletion in 95% of patients, 
If it's very severe, um, you sometimes won't see anything in a newborn, but by the time someone's seven or eight, they'll start to have weakness and uh, droopy eyelids and stuff. And you know, some people call that kern sayer syndrome. That's just a severe form of CPO. Uh, the extreme from an aging perspective is people that have five or 10% mitochondrial DNA deletions at birth. And you won't notice anything until they're 50, 60, or 70 uh, when they start getting droopy eyelids, uh, ophthalmoparesis, cataracts, high frequency sensory neural hearing loss, swallowing issues, and muscle weakness. And so what that shows is that you, know, you have the same genetic disorder, um, and it's just not apparent until aging takes over, and then it gets unmasked later in life. And even Milas syndrome, for example, and almost every disorder that we see um, uh, as time goes on, depending on how severe the underlying defect is, we'll start to see at some point during the aging process that the disease will manifest, which is just aging superimposed on the underlying uh, mutation. So understanding aging is important. One of the constructs in aging that is important is called sarcopenia, and we'll talk about that, and that's the loss of muscle mass. Um, we'll talk about uh, endurance exercise, we'll talk about resistance exercise uh, in both aging as well as mitochondrial disease, and then we'll talk a little bit about some supplements uh, that we've used for aging and um, uh, obesity. So the mitochondria, as uh, all of you uh, are probably familiar, um, started off probably about two billion years ago as a bacteria, and uh, we had a cell uh, during evolution uh, called a proto-eukaryotic cell, which took on the mitochondria in what we call a symbiotic relationship. And that means that it was give and take on each cell, so they agreed to live together. And the mitochondria throughout evolution, uh, we retain this sort of vestigial remnant of the fact that it was originally a bacteria due to the fact that the mitochondrial DNA that you see here is circular, <clears throat> very much like mitochondrial DNA. And uh, when this replicates, the entire mitochondrial DNA replicates, but to build a mitochondria, most of the DNA is actually in what's called the nucleus, uh, which is sort of the brain of your cell. And it takes about 12 to uh, 1300 uh, proteins uh, and other uh, uh, constituents to build a mitochondria. And most of those are now in the nucleus. So throughout evolution, our nucleus has sort of taken on the job of making most of the mitochondria, but we still have 38 genes, which are encoded for by the mitochondrial DNA, which sort of uh, lay down the fundamental template or the core of our mitochondria. What's interesting is that the mitochondrial DNA comes only from mums to their children. The nuclear DNA is a mix where you get DNA from mom and dad. And actually most mitochondrial diseases are uh, either recessive or dominant, meaning that it comes from the nucleus from your parents. Uh, and everyone says this misperception that mitochondrial disease only comes from mitochondrial DNA. Yes, things like Lebers and Milas and MRF do, uh, but many of the things that we see in kids like Lee disease, uh, usually it's a recessive disease where mom and dad each have the mutation in their nucleus and they come together to cause disease, which kind of makes sense given that most of the mitochondria is actually built from the nucleus, not just the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the mitochondrial DNA um, will uh, sort of be shuffled, almost like shuffling a deck of cards. So when you first are formed, when the egg and sperm come together, the mitochondria that come, uh, DNA that come from the mom sort of get randomly segregated into different tissues. And things like blood can sort of select against the bad mitochondria, uh, which is why uh, uh, MILAS patients, MRF patients, for example, will often see very low levels in the blood, but higher levels in tissues that don't turn over so rapidly, like muscle and brain. The other interesting thing is that the mitochondrial DNA has what are called exons. Exons are the coding region of the gene. And you can see here in color, these are all the exons and almost the whole DNA is an exon. Whereas in our nuclear DNA, we have these things called introns and about 99% are introns. It used to be called junk DNA. We know that there's regulatory elements and stuff, but the sort of business end of the DNA really are these exons. That's where most of the coding occurs. So if you have so much of the DNA uh, as an exon, if there's you know, um, sun rays, for example, coming through, which can cause oxidative damage, you're more likely to hit part of the DNA. And as a consequence, uh, this DNA is much more fragile and it has many more mutations that occur uh, throughout uh, our lifespan. And that's why even in healthy people, we start to see mitochondrial DNA deletions accumulating, especially in muscle as people get older. So what does the mitochondria do? Essentially, the food that you've eaten is broken down uh, into these things called reducing equivalents. So your fat, protein, and carbohydrates are sort of ripped apart and the energy uh, is used really uh, to uh, get electrons into this electron transport chain. 
So fats, proteins, and carbohydrates give you these things called reducing equivalents, which feed in here at complex one of the mitochondria or complex two. And essentially all it is, is it's just essentially like an electrical circuit. So it's electrons flowing. So you gain electrons, become reduced, lose electrons and become oxidized. Uh, Leo the lion says, Gur, probably remember that from uh, your chemistry class in grade 12. So anyhow, what happens then is these electrons flow through this elegant system. Uh, complex one and complex two pass them on to coenzyme Q10, which passes it on to complex three and down to complex four. All of the air that we breathe then is used essentially at complex four to reduce oxygen uh, to water. And so that's why if you hold your hand up with a piece of glass and you breathe out, you'll see water coming out. And that's part of the respiratory process. You'll also get carbon dioxide coming out and we consume oxygen. And this is ultimately where the oxygen is consumed. So what happens is this potential energy is almost like having water at the top of Niagara Falls. Uh, that potential energy can flow down through a turbine. And the turbine in our mitochondria is called complex five here. So these protons flow through and that potential energy, just like a turbine spinning, generates electricity. Here we generate what's called ATP, which is the universal energy currency for the cell. So if you have anything that interferes with this elaborate process, you're gonna have less energy for the cell, <coughs> sorry. And with less energy, uh, the cells don't function as well as they otherwise should. So when mitochondria don't work, there's a variety of processes which are activated, which contributes to aging of the cell. So this is a slide uh, where I show how important the mitochondria are to the aging process. So with dysfunctional mitochondria, what happens is we activate something called apoptosis, uh, which is pre-programmed cell death. So cells are just committed then to shrinking and dying. Uh, dysfunctional mitochondria also lead to degradation of the telomeres. Telomeres whoops, are the protective end caps on our chromosomes. And if we have really short telomeres, it eventually tells the cells to stop replicating. And uh, that can contribute to cellular senescence where the cells enter a sort of quiescent zombie-like state and are not very functional. We also know that energy from the mitochondria is important to stimulate the growth of new proteins. And so if we can't grow new proteins, um, things like muscles get skinny. And this is from the NIH, just graphically showing muscle mass in a 30-year-old, a 55-year-old, and an 80-year-old. And this process here is called sarcopenia. We also know that when mitochondria are damaged, they can activate inflammation. So one of the theories of aging is called the inflammaging theory. And if you take the blood from older adults, you'll see that they have this chronic low-grade inflammation, which is probably contributing to damage that occurs. We also know when mitochondria don't work properly, we activate something called oxidative stress. So oxidative stress essentially are these little things called free radicals, which are unpaired electrons, which float around and they can damage DNA, they can damage lipids, and they can damage protein. And all of these tell the cells eventually to shut down. So we've been studying the mitochondria for um, about 30 years now, and uh, we did a lot of work initially looking at athletes, and we still do, to understand the fundamental mechanisms as to how the cells undergo hypertrophy and how we make new mitochondria. Uh, the more we know about these processes and the more we know about how nutrition, drugs, and exercise influence them, we can apply it to our patients who have muscular dystrophy or primary mitochondrial disease. <clears throat> we know, of course, that uh, common disorders like obesity, type 2 diabetes, um, we've even shown that if you immobilize the leg for two weeks, you know, and think about your you know, grandparents or yourself might have gone through a joint replacement and you're in a cast for six weeks or you break a hip and you're in a cast for six weeks, in two weeks, we lost 25% of the mitochondria. So immobility uh, profoundly negatively regulates mitochondria. And so what's interesting in the whole area of mitochondrial medicine, everyone, their dog now thinks they're a mitochondrial specialist and uh, tries to study it because it's involved in so many of these common disorders. Uh, we think we have a leg up on everybody because we've been studying this for 30 years. And so we've been trying to apply what we learned to obesity, diabetes, fatty liver disease, and other disorders. So in fact, uh, what's evident is um, you know, mitochondrial um, dysfunction is not just primary mitochondrial disease. We're starting to see it in almost all of the diseases that we see. So FSH muscular dystrophy, uh, sporadic inclusion body myopathy. Uh, I'll show you a little bit uh, where we've discovered a major mitochondrial dysfunction in myotonic muscular dystrophy. And uh, today we'll talk a bit more about human aging. And again, all of these processes get activated when the mitochondria don't work well. 
but we do feel and we have good evidence to show that you can use nutrition, different drugs and exercise to try and improve function. So again, speaking of aging, um, the sarcopenia is a construct which describes this muscle atrophy, which we talked about earlier. And sarcopenia really just refers to what's called paucity of flesh uh, from the Greek terminology. And it really is when your muscles get skinny, usually they are weaker. Uh, when they're weaker, it can lead to functional impairment, like difficulties going up a flight of stairs, uh, getting out of a chair, getting on and off of a toilet, which leads to an increased cost because people need grab bars, they need the occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and eventually uh, people end up institutionalized. Uh, the cost of sarcopenia is about 40 billion a year in the USA in 2019. Uh, and as you'll see in a minute, that cost is gonna go up big time. And it's gonna go up because the proportion of older adults is just continually, uh, to, uh, continuing to increase, I should say. In fact, I was just reading in The Economist that 41 countries now in the world have a fertility rate that is below the ability to continue to grow the population. So in 41 countries already, uh, the total population will come down. But in doing so, also, we see a shift towards older adults. So there's a much greater proportion of people in first world countries. Um, you know, you think of Japan, um, you know, even the United States here. Look at uh, in 2025, many of the states are going to have over 25% of the people uh, over the age of 65. And of course, what's going to be pulled along for the ride is cancers, sarcopenia, and all of the disorders associated with aging. So why do we age? <clears throat> why do muscles get skinny? Well, we know that we lose our alpha motor neurons. So a nerve goes down to muscle. The alpha motor neurons go from your spinal cord to your muscle. And we've known for decades now that between the ages of 35 and 70, we lose about 30% of our alpha motor neurons. So if you're already predisposed to weakness or mitochondrial dysfunction, then you pull away the nerve and the muscle shrink. We get further dysfunction and weakness. The telomeres we talked about, uh, we get a decrease in protein synthesis. There's further damage to the mitochondrial DNA. So for example, in a healthy individual over the age of 65, almost everyone in their muscle is going to have mitochondrial DNA deletions. But if you've started with CPO, for example, with a deletion um, at 5%, let's say, of your uh, mitochondrial genomes when you're five years of age, uh, and then by the time you're older, that's going to grow in the muscle, and then you start to see clinical manifestations as people get older. Um, we also know that people don't respond as well to um, amino acids. So amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So if you eat eggs or fish or meat or milk, uh, you get good quality protein. As that comes into your body, those um, uh, the protein and everything coming in when we eat, um, it uh, sort of stimulates uh, muscle growth. As we get older, that stimulatory effect um, as tends to be blunted, and we call that anabolic resistance. We also know that the stem cells in our muscle, and indeed most tissues, either uh, are lower in number and or don't respond to the usual signals. Uh, oxidative stress we've talked about, and we'll bring that up again in a minute. Uh, there's also impairments of things called exosomes, which talk between tissues chronic inflammation, but the heart is mitochondria. So mitochondrial disorders um, traditionally refer to uh, diseases that affect the electron transport chain, which is that elaborate system that makes energy. Uh, but we now know as well that there's a whole host of other functions that the mitochondria do uh, where we can have genetic mutations, uh, which affect different things like you know, riboflavin transporter deficiency, nucleotide transporter deficiencies leading to uh, mitochondrial DNA depletion syndromes, uh, et cetera. But the first mutations were described um, uh, almost 40 years ago. Um, Kern-Sayer syndrome was uh, deletions. This really is the same as chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. It's just an earlier onset. Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. Uh, my colleague uh, Doug Wallace first described that um, back in 1988. And Massimo Zabiani described a point mutation in the mitochondrial DNA at 3243 uh, in 1987 and 88. We now know that there's over 200 mitochondrial DNA mutations. But as I pointed out, since most of the mitochondria are made from the nucleus from your mom and dad, there's an increasing recognition with more sophisticated genetic testing of those disorders. The mitochondria are in every cell in our body, but they're particularly important in tissues that don't turn over rapidly. So our brain and our eyes really are an extension of our brain, our hearing nerve, and that's why most people will have hearing loss, droopy eyelids, eyes that don't move very well, optic atrophy and blindness, 
um, cognitive impairment and or seizures, uh, and of course, skeletal muscle with weakness and or atrophy or exercise intolerance. Cardiomyopathy is a particularly bad outcome, uh, usually more in children, uh, but a bad prognostic indicator if you have that. And then these other tissues um, are also affected. The one I'll uh, pull out from an aging perspective is most of our MELAS patients have diabetes. Uh, and in fact, the pancreas, the beta cells, which make insulin, get damaged and the muscles don't respond as well to insulin. So that's the most common thing in MELAS syndrome is um, diabetes and deafness. So the clinical features, again, of course, are going to be manifested in those tissues, which need lots of energy and don't turn over quickly. So we see optic atrophy. This here is retinitis pigmentosa, uh, which uh, impairs your vision. External ophthalmoplegia, as you see in this youngster here, uh, you can see ptosis there. And here, trying to look up, the eyes don't look up. Looking to the left here, this eye doesn't cross the midline. Looking to the right, this eye doesn't cross the midline. That's ophthalmoparesis, ptosis which we see in our CPO spectrum disorder. And I've mentioned some of the other clinical pictures. So again, to make a diagnosis, um, uh, we need a multi-system history, or at least when we hear that, we start thinking about the mitochondria. In medicine, we think of gastroenterology, neurology, uh, dermatology, um, but for mitochondrial medicine specialists like myself, um, we have to train and think outside of the box. Most of us are neurologists, but uh, you know, we have to think about gastrointestinal issues, uh, checking for diabetes, uh, cardiac issues, because the mitochondria, usually when they're affected, they affect multiple systems. Uh, again, since the mitochondrial DNA comes from mums, a strong maternal history is good to rule it in, but an absence doesn't rule it out. Um, lactate, everyone thinks, is your, your main um, biomarker. However, it has a sensitivity of 0.65. What that means is a normal lactate doesn't rule out mitochondrial disease. So Lieber's optic neuropathy, for example, almost invariably the lactate is totally normal. And that's because it tends to be very restricted to the eyes. And as a consequence, we don't have the lactate floating throughout the whole body. Um, in children, we get a lot of false positive lactates. Um, many kids are referred to me with query mitochondrial disease with a high lactate. And it's because the kids are struggling and it's hard to get the blood. So any exercise that you do is gonna generate lactate. And there's a host of other things that we do in terms of a full neurological examination. We check the organic acids, amino acids. We used to, but not as much, do exercise testing. Anyone with neurologic manifestations like ataxia or uh, strokes, et cetera, we always do an MRI and there can be very definitive patterns uh, like this kid here with Lee disease. Uh, more of us are using this thing called plasma GDF-15, which goes up when you have mitochondrial dysfunction. We're using less muscle biopsies now uh, or enzymology because, as I mentioned, two weeks in an immobilization splint, you lose 25% of your mitochondria. So we were getting all sorts of false positive uh, patients. And unfortunately, there's many people in North America and around the world who are diagnosed with mitochondrial disease who actually don't have it. And we have um, at least a dozen patients who are labeled as mitochondrial disease where they did a biopsy, said you have complex one deficiency, but without genetic testing or you know, continuing to think outside the box, people miss muscular dystrophies, malignant hyperthermia, and a whole host of other disorders, copy number variations. Um, and so it's really important now to start moving towards genetics uh, to get a definitive genetic diagnosis. So let's uh, focus the rest of this on, you know, what are we gonna do about all this stuff? How can we treat? Uh, so one of the things uh, that we generally tell our patients is avoid extreme stress. So extreme heat, uh, dehydration, prolonged fasting. And when I say excessive exercise, every human being can push themselves to muscle damage, even if you're an able-bodied athlete. Um, we have to listen to our body, gradually get used to exercise, and then it's good for you, but you can't just jump in and suddenly exercise too hard. So, um, and again, when you're exercising, make sure that, you know, it's in a, a thermal neutral environment, not extreme heat and humidity, uh, which puts more stress on the body. Make sure you're well hydrated and make sure you've got some food in your belly, like have something to eat three to four hours before uh, so that you're not fasting. We also check sleep in all of our patients. Uh, there can be things like seizures at night, there can be sleep apnea, and all of these are quite treatable. Uh, if there's sleep disorders, uh, which can occur in mitochondrial disease, and abnormal sleep can affect clock genes, which can make mitochondria crappy, so it becomes a positive feedback. Um, there's some pretty good evidence that melatonin has neuroprotective effects, uh, on the mitochondria, and it's quite a safe supplement. 
Uh, we usually start off with one milligram, three, five, and up to 10 if need be. Um, I won't talk about this. Uh, pain, again, is not really any more common in mitochondrial patients than it is in the general population. And the same is true of uh, patients with muscular dystrophy. So if you see that somebody has pain, usually there's another reason for it. Um, so we check to make sure there's not uh, bursitis, tendonitis, um, you know, they pinched a nerve, for example, because if you always just lump any pain and say, oh, it's part of your disease, you fail to find what the true generator is, and there's often very effective therapy. Uh, in kids in particular, we're really trying to optimize growth, but it's also important as we age, the number one problem with older adults is that they don't get enough protein with breakfast and lunch. They tend to skip it, or you probably heard the term tea and toasters, where people are you know, just having tea and, you know, high carbohydrate toast and jam and not getting good quality protein. So to maintain your muscles, you really need that um, uh, protein with breakfast and with uh, supper as well. So a couple of things that we'd recommend from an eating perspective, uh, don't fast for long periods of time. So again, you know, people who eat a big uh, dinner and then they skip breakfast, you know, you're going to be going 16 hours with nothing in your belly. Uh, which uh, especially with mitochondrial disease or muscular dystrophy and with aging, we want to have, you know, generally three meals a day and have some protein with breakfast, lunch, and supper as well. So uh, not just one meal a day, generally, uh, um, you know, spreading it out throughout the day. Um, and we'll talk about this. Um, this point here, I just wanted to uh, point out that especially in women, iron deficiency is pretty common. And the way we look for iron deficiency is something called ferritin. So for mitochondrial patients, uh, we always try to get the ferritin over 50. Most of our men are over 50, um, but many of our women are quite low. And why that's important is that the mitochondria need these iron sulfur clusters. So we always try to keep um, the ferritin up over 50, and we always measure that and check and replace in our patients. In Canada, and uh, I've heard from colleagues in the States that vitamin D uh, insufficiency is very common. 85% of our patients are not meeting current Canadian guidelines and 15% are severely deficient. So we always check and replace. Um, the other thing is that uh, when someone has a genetic disease, doctors, um, if they're not really thinking about it, just assume anything that happens to you is from your disease. But don't forget the common things. B12 deficiency can cause peripheral neuropathy. It can cause ataxia. It can cause spasticity. It can cause dementia. All of those can be seen in mitochondrial disease but you don't want to miss a opportunity to treat. So we always check vitamin D, we check ferritin, we check folic acid, uh, we check vitamin E, we check for copper deficiency, and we replace these things if they're low. Generally, we'd say, uh, you know, avoid uh, alcohol um, in excess, um, you know, one or two drinks a day in spite of some crazy recent Canadian guidelines saying it's going to cause cancer, which I think is garbage, uh, but we'll get into that. Uh, you know, don't uh, you know, try not to drink more than two drinks per day. Uh, and again, patients patient with Milas syndrome, um, uh, MSG can trigger migraines in these patients. And there's a few other migraine trigger, triggers like uh, red wine and H cheeses. So getting more specific, um, what uh, happens when you have mitochondria that don't work and how can we target them? So when you have mitochondrial dysfunction, one of the things that happens is we create these reactive oxygen species or free radicals. And that's where antioxidants come in because antioxidants can eat those things up and uh, prevent them from damaging parts of the cell. Other things that um, we can do is we can try and bypass defects. So if you have a complex one defect, giving high doses of coenzyme Q10 here, you can see you're, you're on the other end of that. So you can bypass the defect. CoQ10, uh, especially if it's partnered with another antioxidant, can form a redox couple and can be an antioxidant. Um, and then the other thing we can do is we can give alternative energy sources. So that's where creatine comes in because creatine is important and energy flux through the cell and it's a nice buffer in the cytosol. Uh, so we usually uh, provide an alternative energy source, which is creatine. So these are the strategies. As I mentioned, you can try and bypass the defect. Uh, we and others have looked at CoQ10, Ingridtain, and others have tried succinate and riboflavin. There are specific mitochondrial diseases like a riboflavin transporter deficiency where we use super high levels. Uh, lowering lactate really seems logical, but it doesn't work. So people uh, decades ago thought that they could use this thing called DCA, which some of you might have heard about. Um, and we still use that in, in PDH deficiency. And I know that um, uh, Peter Stackpole in, in Florida is still looking at that. But in long-term use, it can cause damage to your nerves. So we generally don't use that. 
Antioxidants, uh, we usually pair things like lipoic acid, which is in the mitochondria with CoQ10, which is in the mitochondria. Vitamin E protects the membrane, so it works in a different strategy. Alternative energy, uh, creatine, and we'll talk about uh, exercise. In Mila syndrome, um, there is um, pretty reasonable evidence that arginine is helpful. We know that they have low arginine and low citrulline, and uh, those are precursors for a dilation substance called um, um, nitric oxide. And so uh, we generally will replace with an acute stroke with intravenous arginine and then provide that as an oral supplement. We check and replace folate, and I won't talk about the other one. So we did a study uh, years ago. Um, UMDF, nobody would fund me. So I used my own um, personal money uh, to fund this study. Um, so this was one of my grad students, and uh, we did a randomized double-blind crossover study. Uh, it was two months on therapy, two months off, and then two months uh, on placebo or vice versa. And neither us nor the patients knew what the uh, codes were until the study was done and analyzed. So we had them on CoQ10, vitamin E, creatine and alpha lipoic acid. So again, this is what we call our mito core. Uh, this is what we came up with as sort of, we thought, or I thought was gonna be the optimal supplement. And uh, we had 16 patients with genetically confirmed mitochondrial disease. And we showed that lactate was lower when they were on the supplement versus placebo. Oxidative stress was reduced. Another, um, oops. Oh, darn, that's the same slide. I apologize. Uh, we had other markers of oxidative stress, which were lower as well. So what about um, other strategies? So exercise, we know with aging that exercise is important and exercise uh, will lower all cause mortality. That means your death rate. Um, it is estimated that if people exercise three times a week for a half an hour, uh, you will get four years of lifespan extension. Um, so that's uh, uh, about you know, the, the average that we see uh, people who generally habitually exercise. And that's uh, generally, you know, on average of about 10 years of uh, steady exercise, you'll lower your risk of death. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, which shows that exercise is not just beneficial for your heart and your lungs, which you kind of think of, or your muscle, uh, it uh, has a systemic benefit. And so people who exercise, and you can see here, this is hours of vigorous activity. So we get this early drop um, where you get about a four-year lifespan extension. Um, by only exercising 30 minutes three times per week. But if we continue or not continue or exercise more frequently or longer, uh, we start to really see other things go down. So cancers, and in fact, there was a study that looked at over a million individuals and um, almost every single cancer has a lower rate in people who do regular exercise. So it clearly shows that exercise uh, has these multi-systemic benefits. So again, this is all based on more um, endurance activity. So things like going for a brisk walk, uh, cycling, um, uh, cross-country skiing, et cetera. So we did some studies uh, where we wanted to look at the, um, uh, this is again, uh, it's, it's called an unbiased approach. So we took no a priori hypothesis as to what would happen. And we looked at every metabolite in the human body and said, well, what happens if you start exercising, what happens if you've been exercising for years? So we had young people who were sedentary or top sport athletes, and we had older people who were, have been athletes most of their life or who were sedentary. And then we took the sedentary people and we trained them for a period of three months with endurance exercise. Uh, some of you probably know Dr. Bob Navio at UCSD, um, probably the smartest guy I've ever met in my life. Um, and uh, he's the guy who ran the metabolomics for us. And um, he's got a really fancy million dollar machine, which looked at the entire body's metabolism. So this is called principal component analysis. You don't need to know what that means specifically. All it shows is that if you um, are an older person and a younger person, you can see that the metabolites are different in young people versus older adults. And what happens is that the older adults who have been exercising most of their life, you can see they've shifted towards the metabolomics of a younger person. So it's to some extent keeping you younger, it's youthening the individual. And then we also uh, looked at the young um, people who are athletes and they were even, um, they had an even better metabolic profile. And then the older adults, even after three months could shift this over. So you don't need to exercise your whole life. Even if you're 65 or older, any exercise is good exercise and you will always get benefits. Even after three months, we showed a shift towards the younger people.
But what's interesting is that these are the top pathways. So again, without um, you know, hypothesizing beforehand, the big thing that we saw was crappy mitochondria as we get older. So with aging, we see decreases in mitochondria. We see that you can't oxidize fats very well. Intercellular communication goes down. Protein synthesis goes down. And a lot of these change as we get older. I'll just highlight one that's kind of interesting is the microbiome, and that's your, um, your, your poo, for lack of a better term. Uh, we now know that the microbiome has to be healthy, and that changes in a favorable uh, response to exercise uh, and also to eating a, a, um, a broad diet, especially with lots of leafy green vegetables and a variety of uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, berries, for example, all of these things help to improve your microbiome. And then it feeds back through these metabolites to keep your mitochondria healthy. And again, vitamin D metabolism, very important. And that's why it's just so important to measure your vitamin D and try and get it up over 75 nanomoles per liter. Uh, if it's less than 30, it can cause osteoporosis and muscle weakness. So what about mitochondrial disease? Um, does exercise help uh, individuals? Because a lot of people say, oh, you know, I get so short of breath, there's no way I can exercise, so I'm going to sit on my butt and do nothing. So we know that um, low VO2 max is an actual hallmark of mitochondrial disease. We did a study years ago in MELAS patients, and the oxygen consumption uh, was only about nine milliliters per kilogram per minute. So just sitting around, it's between three and four. The average person is around 25 to 30. So you can see how impaired these patients were. Now we'll see in a minute that we can improve that. As I mentioned, 14 days of immobilizing a leg will downregulate your mitochondria. So what too many people do is that they're told to conserve energy, sit on their butt, uh, watch TV, don't move, uh, but it just makes mitochondrial disease worse because you can imagine a year of doing very little exercise, what that's gonna do to your mitochondria. We do know that exercise can increase your mitochondrial activity. It'll increase your VO2 max. And in patients, um, you know, anytime we can increase the delivery of oxygen by getting the heart to pump better, uh, delivering more to those mitochondria, it should be beneficial. But does it actually work? So we've known now for over 20 years that it does work. So this is a group in Copenhagen, and they took patients uh, with um, mitochondrial disease, uh, genetically confirmed, and they looked at healthy controls to see are they similar. And what they found is in response to 12 weeks of exercising, now again, you don't just jump in uh, at 75% of your maximal capacity and try and go for half an hour because you won't make it. We've had patients who started out uh, with either mitochondrial disease or um, uh, myotonic dystrophy who could only last like you know 45 seconds on the bike when we first started. And our one patient with myotonic dystrophy who was lasting 46 seconds at the beginning after three months got up to three times a week for 35 minutes on the bike. But again, everyone's different. Start with almost no resistance and gradually build up. So they ramped these folks up to 75% of VO2 max four times a week, um, and they improved their mitochondrial total mass by uh, 67%, which was roughly correlated with their VO2 max, and it went up the same for both patients and controls. And what they showed is that it was safe, uh, patients didn't show any breakdown of the muscle, and the muscle looked structurally healthy. In that same journal, um, a different independent group uh, came to the same conclusions. So these are patients who had CPEO, they did 14 weeks of bike training. Again, I won't get into details. It's very similar to what they uh, did in the other study. And then they said, well, what happens if you stop? And uh, what they found, very similar improvements in their ability to exercise. They could suck more oxygen into the muscles. That means the mitochondria are better. But importantly, this is one of the first studies that showed that quality of life got better. So do you feel better going up a flight of stairs? Are you more able to do your laundry, et cetera, et cetera? But again, if you don't uh, use it, you lose it. So everyone went right back to baseline after 14 weeks of not doing anything. So there have been um, you know, quite a few studies uh, published um, across you know, all of those disorders that I said have either primary or secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. Most of what we know is aging because there have been hundreds of studies showing the benefits of endurance exercise in aging uh, and also with resistance training. And uh, we can see improvements in strength, endurance, quality of life, um, uh, body composition, which is your muscle to fat ratio got better and mitochondria goes up, oxidative stress goes down and inflammation goes down. It's interesting that, you know, years ago when I suggested exercise was helpful, people said, well, it's going to cause too much inflammation and it's going to increase oxygen stress. 
but these actually go down, not up. So the first time you exercise, they go up, but the body gets accustomed to it. And we get all these antioxidant enzymes that go up and we actually protect the cells. So we've done some studies, as I mentioned before, uh, we were the first to discover a major mitochondrial um, defect in patients with myotonic muscular dystrophy. This is a muscular dystrophy. It's uh, not a, a primary problem in the mitochondria, uh, but because the uh, what's called the RNA gets screwed up, uh, you get uh, mitochondria that don't work very well. So we looked at 11 patients with myotonic dystrophy, and again, three months of cycling three times per week at 65% of VO2 peak, which practically is about where you're just starting to have difficulty carrying on a conversation. Now, again, we uh, had one lady, as I mentioned, who was uh, under a minute on the bike with zero tension, uh, and we eventually got her up to three times a week uh, for 35 minutes. And what we found was they had mitochondrial disease. So if you look here, these are controls. These are our patients uh, before. This is uh, a stain called SDH. So um, with this stain, you can see how pale they are. And that just means the mitochondrial enzymes are low, but look at how they improved after training. And you can see it here, if we actually look at the proteins in the mitochondria, very low uh, beforehand comparing um, controls to patients, but look at the dramatic improvement across the board in the mitochondria. We also found it was safe. Their heart was uh, uh, doing well. Their muscle enzymes didn't go up. Uh, joints were fine. We do a thing called the six minute walk test where we go back and forth for six minutes. It went up by 47 meters. And then we do this thing where they have to get up and down from a chair um, and that improved. And why that's important is again, that's function. So if you can't get out of a chair, you need uh, you know somebody to help you. You need to have a high chair. You need to have um, uh, an OT or PT or somebody living with you. Um, there's improvement in fitness, and interestingly, there's an increase in muscle mass by about 1.6 kilograms. We've also done studies, we haven't published this yet, uh, but in FSH, where we see mitochondrial deficits, we look back on our patients over the last 10 years, those who exercised three times a week or more, and those who sat on their butt and did nothing. And this is their kicking strength. You can see it went down 3% in those who exercised and 34% in those that didn't. And this is the arm strength that went down 4% in those that exercised and 38% in those that didn't. So again, there, if there was a drug that did this, I'd be a billionaire right now. There is no drug in the world that has been shown to have any benefits anywhere close to this in any form of muscular dystrophy. So we'll also uh, talk about hypertrophy or resistance or strength training. So we've done studies in older adults, again, because they have secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. And this is just twice per week going to the gym. So they came to our gym, we exercise, trained them. And what we do with exercise with resistance is a little bit different. So we do what are called uh, reps and sets. So a rep is how many times you do a repetition. And if I do, let's say eight, and I go do something else, come back and do eight, that's set one, set two. Uh, for anyone on this call, um, what you should do to learn about how to exercise and we have a specific um, a video just on mitochondrial disease and all the principles of exercise. If you go to YouTube and if you type in the neuromuscular junction and Dr. Tarnopolsky, you can see all of our um, uh, different slides. So in this study, we did weight training. We did muscle biopsies. What we found uh, very similar, and this is a totally different way of looking at it. This is looking at the RNA, not just the metabolites. And we showed mitochondrial dysfunction and inflammation before they started. But after we did the exercise, the mitochondria got better and the inflammation came down. So the older adults following three months of weight training became younger. They looked more like the young individuals. There was less difference between young and old. So that was pretty cool to show at the gene level and the cellular level, we were youthening the muscle just by uh, doing resistance training. So what about mitochondrial patients? This is my uh, good friend and colleague, Tanya Tapasalo. Again, eight patients who had CPEO and they did uh, standard weight training. So here's a typical gym. Um, they were doing, knee, this is called knee extension, leg press, those are things, especially the leg press. I like that, it's quite a safe, good exercise. And it's very functional because you leg press when you get up from a chair going up a flight of stairs. So they did standard weight training with these individuals. They showed a significant improvement in their strength and they showed that it was not causing muscle damage. So again, everything we've learned in older adults applies to patients with mitochondrial disease. It's just if you've got mitochondrial disease and you're already behind the eight ball, relatively, it's gonna be a much bigger bang for your buck. 
Now, are there any supplements that can enhance uh, the benefits of endurance exercise? So I'll just mention creatine because we've been big fans of that uh, because it makes sense. And we've published studies since 1999 in this area. So creatine comes in from food that we eat, meats and fish. Um, it's also made in our pancreas and kidneys and eventually through the liver. Most of it ends up in our muscle, but it's also critical for nerve function and brain function. And then the creatine is broken down to creatinine and excreted through our kidneys. What does creatine do? When we start contracting our skeletal muscle, as you can see up here, when it contracts, we break down the energy currency called ATP, uh, which then leads to an increase in ADP. But if that goes on for too long without us replenishing ATP, the muscle will break down. So we've got all sorts of cool buffers in our system. The first thing we have is creatine. So creatine exists as phosphocreatine, which regenerates the energy here and keeps the cell alive for long enough for this system to turn on your mitochondria because this system will only last for you know, probably 10 to 20 seconds, but it'll kickstart the mitochondria, get them to provide energy so you can you know, continue to walk, uh, go for a run, a jog, you know, go to the store, whatever it might be. But this is a nice buffer. The creatine also enhances this energy flux to the mitochondria, which is why uh, we and others thought that it might be beneficial in muscle disease. So we tried it in older adults. And what we did here is we took men and women. Again, almost all of our studies, we had equal number of men and women. We did a strength training program uh, with them. And we didn't know what they were on. They didn't know what they were on, but half were on creatine, half were on placebo. And what we showed is that we could load their muscle. So the creatine stays in their muscle and increases the concentration. Geez, sorry, it's a little twitchy here. Um, but those who took the creatine gained more fat-free uh, mass. So this is muscle mass versus those on placebo. Jeepers, sorry about that. And the strength was better for those uh, who were taking the creatine versus placebo. So it enhanced the benefits. Everyone got better, but you got more better. <laughs> uh, you improved the benefits when you took the creatine. So um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Stuart Phillips, um, uh, published a study in older adults where they said, let's take all the world literature, put it all together and take the best uh, uh, supplements and come up with the ultimate uh, supplement to improve muscle mass. So uh, what uh, Stu came up with was whey plus calcium plus vitamin D, creatine and fish oil. And he compared it to collagen. Some of you might have been to the store recently and you see these little things of collagen for 50 bucks and people say how great it is. That was the placebo in Stu's study. And what he showed was an increase in strength, muscle mass, uh, and even cognition. So people's memory and uh, cognition got better. Uh, there was lower inflammation and a lipid called a triglyceride, and that's been published. Um, again, full disclosure, uh, we bought the patent from Stu, uh, and then we replicated his uh, study, and we tweaked the uh, formula a little bit by adding something called casein. Uh, but we were pretty pleased that we showed the same thing that Stu showed, so we could increase uh, muscle mass without increasing fat, so the muscle to fat ratio got better, strength went up, but importantly, for the first time, we showed that your function got better, so getting sit to stand was better for um, this supplement versus taking collagen. Now, a lot of supplements out there, people say, oh, you know, whey is good, casein is good, collagen is good, but almost every study compares it to nothing. So for older adults or people with mitochondrial disease or muscular dystrophy, if you give them no protein, you know, they're not likely to get benefits. So you give them any kind of protein, it's going to look good. So that's why, um, you know, we went head to head against another type of protein. So you could truly control for the amount of protein that came in. So another problem uh, with uh, aging, and you'll see in a minute with mitochondrial disease, is that you get obese, but it's often hidden. And so as we age, when you lose muscle, you don't turn muscle to fat, but if you decrease muscle, don't move as much, your metabolic rate's lower, you tend to get more body fat because if you're taking the same amount of calories, you'll put on some body fat. So you don't convert muscle into fat, but as muscle shrinks and you replace uh, that eventually with fat, it's not really converting one to the other, it's just decreasing uh, one uh, source and increasing the other. And we call that sarcopenic obesity. Oops, oops. All right. Uh, so we did a, a study, um, again, my daughter's working on this right now, we haven't published it yet, where we looked at our patients, and this came into sharp focus for me, where some of our mitochondrial patients were coming in, and uh, these individuals looked normal weight, and in some cases, we had one young lady who came in recently who had a body mass index of 17, which put her in the underweight category, 
But when we put her through a special machine called the DEXA scanner to see how much fat she had, she was grossly obese. So her um, obesity um, fat percentage was 65%. And yet the BMI was telling her that she was uh, underweight. Now, you may have heard that the American Medical Association has expressed concerns about the use of the BMI for different reasons. What we're finding is that it, uh, it grossly underestimates obesity. And so a lot of patients, the family doctor says, oh, you look cool. You looked thin, you know, you actually look too thin. Eat more, eat more. I don't care what you eat, take potato chips, whatever, just put on weight, but not knowing that they already are obese. And so it's really important to know what the composition is. So we recommend a DEXA scan, which measures your bone, your fat, and your muscle, so you can truly know what the composition is, and then meet with a nutritionist to optimize your composition, not just be a slave to this BMI. So bottom line is, is that we are in patients we're undercalling obesity um, um, if we don't uh, measure their full body composition with a DEXA scanner. So how can we improve both muscle uh, and reduce fat? So one of the issues is, of course, everyone knows about this, Ozempic and all these GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, these are great drugs and they've revolutionized the treatment of diabetes and the side effect was people lost weight. The problem with those drugs is when you, your brain says don't eat, which is what they do, they tell you to stop eating. Uh, when you lose weight, you tend to lose quite a bit of muscle, which we've seen in a lot of our patients. So how do you keep muscle up while losing body fat and not have the two come down together? Again, the only way you'll know is if you do a DEXA scan, which is unfortunate that the FDA approves weight loss drugs on weight, not on fat loss. And so uh, we've looked at some strategies. So one of them here, this is 20 men and 20 women. We did six months of weight training and uh, we gave them creatine. And we gave them this thing called conjugated linoleic acid, which is a safe over-the-counter supplement, which has been shown in a variety of studies to cause fat loss. And what we showed in these individuals is that you can increase your muscle mass while decreasing body fat. Now, just regular training is a good way to go. So if anyone out there is on Ozempic, um, you know, it's a great drug. Make sure you're monitored with your doctor, but do some exercise. It's, it's never been proven, but it's almost 100% certain that if you do resistance exercise, you will better maintain your lean body mass while you decrease your energy intake and lower your body fat. But certainly here you can see, of course, you exercise, train, you're going to increase lean mass and you're going to decrease body fat. These are older adults, men and women, but you can accentuate that by giving creatine and you can accentuate the fat loss uh, with this uh, CLA. Now, we've done innumerable studies showing that uh, we have a fat loss agent uh, that is much better than CLA. We actually had CLA in it in our preclinical studies and found that taking it out didn't, um, didn't make a difference. So it, it was not really a, a critical factor. So we did this study where we looked at all sorts of different weight loss agents. Uh, but our key um, hypothesis was if obesity is a mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, let's use our mito enhancer. So we had creatine, alpha lipoic acid, CoQ10, nitrates. We tried all sorts of weight loss things, including CLA, because it worked for us before. Uh, but we did innumerable preclinical studies and showed that these were the essential seven um, uh, items. And that was published in this journal. So what we did essentially is we had mice uh, that were obese, and we showed that we could reduce the obesity. Um, the fat pads were much lower uh, with these supplements. This is fatty liver disease, which is a huge problem in uh, North America, in fact, in the whole world, and that was um, uh, mostly mitigated with a metabolic enhancer. This was published in 2021, and Rick Austin just published another one on the fatty liver disease um, two months ago. This is in Rick's paper showing the fatty liver disease and how this TRIM7, which is the essential seven ingredients, uh, almost completely reversed it, almost as good as exercise. And what we found, if you combine exercise with this, uh, you got double the benefits. And again, how does it work? Interesting, it turns on mitochondria. So these are what are called browning measures. Uh, so our adipose tissue under our, our belly is white adipose tissue. Browning just means there's more mitochondria. So these are browning markers. And so this is a high fat diet, but what we found is if you exercise, you brown adipose tissue. So you activate mitochondria in your fat. And that's why you tend to lose uh, fat mass when you exercise. But this ME3 is actually that trim seven. So we also could turn it on with that. Uh, and it works well with exercise. And oftentimes it was the exercise plus this trim seven that worked best. 
And again, PGC1-alpha, this is the master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis. So this is the orchestrator that says, turn on mitochondria or not. And you can see how it's repressed in high-fat diet, um, improved with the TRIM-7, but uh, even better if you exercise and take these supplements. And this is a mitochondrial subunit. And these are fat oxidation. So you burn more fat um, when you're taking these things. So exercise, fantastic, good way to burn fat. Um, and you can be similar with these supplements, but again, the best uh, um, that we always see is exercise really is the most important factor. The other things are icing on the cake. And inflammation, lower. So inflammation is bad and it's much higher, uh, but that could be lowered again, just with exercise. And again, the best is usually exercise plus this metabolic enhancer. We've done a clinical trial in humans. Uh, this should be coming out in the next uh, month. It's uh, in final review right now. We had 60 overweight men and women uh, during COVID, uh, which was a challenge to do the study. And we had them on this TRIM-7 or placebo. And because the FDA wants it, uh, we had weight loss as the outcome. And you can see on the TRIM-7, there was a much greater weight loss versus the placebo. Uh, and we also showed that fatty liver disease markers went down 26%. So that's uh, just a tiny scratch in the surface of what we've done in aging and mitochondria where there's a bit of overlap. Uh, these are all the folks that helped to contribute uh, to all the work that we've done and I'll take any questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Trampolski. We have so many questions and I know we're hitting, hitting to noon so I hope you can stay with us just a little bit longer. Um, if you, I'm gonna go ahead and, and at, start asking just a couple that have filtered right. in. Um, one was, um, what do you think about electrical muscle stimulation like catalyst EMS suit to augment resistance training? Uh, I think it's garbage. Um, uh, don't waste your money. Um, to be perfectly blunt, uh, one expensive. What works is, you know, good old mother nature, just doing the activity. Um, if you want to just stimulate a muscle, the only time there's any evidence of benefit is if you're in a cast you can help to prevent some of the atrophy by cutting holes in the cast and stimulating the muscle then. So under those extreme conditions, it can help to prevent atrophy. But for somebody who wants to exercise, you know, spend the money to get a gym membership, go somewhere where there's a kinesiologist who you can talk to and say, look, I've got this disease, read these papers by Dr. Tavisalo, uh, go to the, um, you know, um, neuromuscular junction by Dr. Tarnopolsky, get the principles and help me do this safely. And uh, you will gain so much more. You're going to meet new people. You're going to have fun versus just shocking yourself and getting little benefit. Um, so we've had a lot of questions come in in regards to exercise and how to kind of approach that. Um, so I'm going to try to filter through those simultaneously if possible. One of the questions was, if you have any recommendations or thoughts about those who struggle with motion sickness, nausea, or dizziness, and how to approach exercise. Yeah, so I mean, I guess for the, the, the first thing is, um, yes, um, as a, a, a former uh, elite athlete, I push myself to barfing. Uh, uh, you, if you push yourself too hard, uh, it's very common to feel sick to your stomach and to vomit. And certainly with Milas syndrome, we've seen a lot of people who get sick to, uh, to their stomach. You've got to listen to your body, make sure it's a cool environment. Um, heat will uh, make you more nauseated. Um, make sure also that the activity you're doing, you know, you don't want the environment to move a lot. So going out on a bike, is probably not the best for you. A nice recumbent bike where your head's not moving would be a good place to start, especially if you feel a little bit off balance, you know, which many people, Milas, Murph, et cetera, will have. So a nice smooth um, recumbent bike uh, would be a good place to start. Don't try and read on the bike, but looking off in the distance, you know, at Netflix or something will help with compliance and just, you know, keep your head nice and nice and straight. So those are some things. An elliptical might be tough for someone that has vertigo because you're going up and down a little bit. So again, you want that head to stay nice and straight uh, when you're doing it. Um, heat is a real uh, issue for people that really makes you feel um, nauseated and vertiginous. So good hydration um, you know, is a good place to start. Again, I would encourage people to go to our YouTube. We did this specifically because you know, I can't, I'm not a personal trainer, it's hard to go into these, but we do have kinesiologists who work with us and we've got these really nice videos uh, and there's a whole section just on mitochondrial disease. So I'd encourage you to see that, but that's a great question about the, the vertigo. Yeah. 
Well, and I would love to, um, I'll talk with you after because I want to make sure that we get that link so we can get it because a lot of people have asked, um, where do I find that? Where do I find that? So I'll um, make sure that I touch base with you and make sure that I find the right location for everybody to be able to see that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the recumbent bank, which is interesting because we had a patient kind of ask about that. Like, what is um, what is the difference between using a recumbent bike rather than a stationary bike? Because their doctor had encouraged them to use the recumbent bike and they feel like it's better for their body, but they don't really understand why. Yeah. Yeah. So a recumbent bike, essentially, if you look at me in this chair, uh, usually there'll be sort of a chair structure and the, uh, it'll be in front of you. You can, um, you know, get a cheap one called a QB, which is somewhat similar. It's, it sits on the floor. Um, the nice thing about a recumbent bike is that the the backrest and everything is much more comfortable for you. There's some hand rest. And certainly anyone with ataxia, I'd encourage you to start with that because you can, even if you're in a wheelchair, you can slide over and transfer into a recumbent bike. Uh, and, uh, you know, you adjust the seat because you don't want your legs to go way out like this. You want your knee to be about like this angle. So about 20 to 25 degrees when you're pushing out. So it's going to go back and forth like this when you're going around. They're very smooth. I encourage someone to be thinking seven, eight hundred dollars to get one that works, or go to a gym where they have, you know, two, three thousand dollar beautiful ones. Um, they're nice and quiet. So, from a compliance perspective, a lot of people say it's boring. But if you're watching YouTube and you watch, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary or whatever, uh, you know, it's just gonna, it's it's easy to do when you're on a recumbent bike. And again, you're not bouncing around a lot if you've got vertigo. But uh, whatever you enjoy is the right exercise for you, um, you know, because if you don't enjoy it, you ain't going to do it. And it's all about being compliant uh, and consistent in what you do. We've had um, we've had several athletes right in trying to figure out how do you recommend balancing weight training benefits and the correlating symptoms slash fatigue that can be debilitating in the hours slash days after workout. Um, even one pound dumbbells sometimes can seem like it creates issues afterwards. So how do you go about navigating that? And is there a particular doctor that you recommend working with patients to try to figure out that balance? Yeah, everyone's so different. There's no way in God's earth you can give a, a uniform uh, issue other than general principles. Number one, you know, it's, it's damage and repair. So you don't want it have extreme damage. But what I mean by that is that you will feel tired and fatigued and then your body will adapt. It's called physiological adaptation or hormesis is the other name for it. Patients with mitochondrial disease will get that adaptation. It just is harder to start. So for example, um, you know, the myotonic dystrophy lady starting off, I mean, she was trashed at 40 seconds or so on the bike with zero watch. She was just spinning the pedals. She was absolutely spent heart rate of 180. Um, but by the end of three months, carefully easing her in, letting her take a break, let those, the body adaptations occur, uh, she was able to go three times a week for 35 minutes uh, by the end of our study. So if you really take the time to let the body recover, what happens is, you know, for many patients with mitochondrial disease who are sedentary, late, late, we'll call this your threshold, it's really low. So even daily activities, you know, it totally wipes you out. And what we're doing with exercise is, yeah, you might be a little tired at first, but eventually you bump that threshold up so that when you're doing daily activities, it's not totally taxing you out. Uh, and that's the whole goal behind exercise. But again, you've got to have proper nutrition. You've got to have exercise and recovery. If you don't recover properly, you're not going to get the benefits. And we want to slowly bump that threshold up in a very safe manner. Uh, but again, it's the neuromuscular junction with Dr. Tarnopolsky on YouTube. All those principles are, are there for you. So the, the woman that couldn't tolerate up to 40 seconds, you basically use that as her baseline to help yep. build. So sometimes not being discouraged that our baseline might be super, super low, but we just got to build on what we got, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. Uh, the worst mitochondrial patient I've ever seen um, was a, a lady. Uh, when I first started practice, uh, her VO2 max was 6.4 milliliters per kilogram per minute. So she was working as a nurse. I don't know how the hell she did it because 6.4, if you get up to get a milk from the fridge, you're pretty much at 6.4 mils per kilogram. So her threshold was at just basic daily activities of daily living. And so we put her on the bike. She lasted about 30 seconds on the bike at zero watts. But again, Okay, we gave her a couple of days to recover, came back and we said, okay, now you're going to go 40 seconds. Now you're going to go 50 seconds, you know, and then eventually she was able to last, you know, not as long as our myotonic patient, but she could go 15, 20 minutes on the bike at a low intensity, but her threshold was so much higher by relative comparison after that period of time. 
One patient asked, you know, a lot of times doctors encourage patients to exercise at least three times a week, but do you think that daily exercise um, gradually slower is better? Or do you feel like having breaks in between is helpful? Yeah, when, again, when you start, it may be two or three days to recover before you can go back to it. Uh, eventually, most people, you know, in, 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 in proper clinical trials with, you know, ta that Tanya's done and um, the, the Doug Turnbull's group has done, we've done with a whole host of different disorders. After a period of time, people can sometimes get up to three, four, or even five, six times a week. Uh, the ideal would be to strive for doing one type one day like endurance and then, you know, weights probably twice a week, uh, you know, seems to be enough to start getting things up. The other thing I'd point out with uh, patients with mitochondrial disease is we have in Mila syndrome, some who have incredibly low VO2 max, but their strength's pretty good. We have other patients with Mila's who are incredibly weak, but their endurance isn't so bad. Um, and so start to your strengths. So if you have a really low VO2 max, but your muscle bulk's not bad, you know, start off with a bit of resistance training because it's something you're used to. And then you will secondarily get a little bit of aerobic benefits. And then you start titrating in the uh, endurance activity or vice versa. You know, so those are things. Can you talk a little bit about after you exercise, um, you know, the, the days after you exercise, how that might affect your cognitive function? Um, some patients have mentioned that after exercise, it seems like they're not just wiped, but their cognitive function is their connection between the two, or is it just has, does it have to do with like your, your energy yeah, levels in general? Think, yeah. So a couple of things, one, um, you know, we want everything to be perfect. I do at least in all of my patients. So I want the nutrition to be perfect. I want your, you know, vitamin milieu to be perfect. I don't want any deficiencies. And probably the biggest thing which leads to chronic daily fatigue, which is garbage when people say that mitochondrial disease causes chronic daily fatigue, no offense to anyone, it's 99.9% .9 of the time that you have poor sleep or something else that's identifiable. Because if you think about it, at rest, at sleep, you are recovering. Your mitochondria aren't even working. So it's that non-restorative uh, sleep when you're trashed in the morning that is not mitochondrial disease. And I'm telling you, like, you know, 99% of our patients with MELAS, MRF, CTO, whatever, yeah, they have exercise intolerance, they have fatigue, they have weakness, they have ataxia, whatever. But if they have non-restorative sleep, you look to the sleep. It's usually that they have sleep apnea, some sort of sleep impairment. And that is what gives you that morning fatigue more than anything else. And so exercising at night, right before you go to bed, bad idea is going to screw you up. Caffeine after four o'clock going to screw up your sleep. And if you screw up your sleep, you'll screw up your clock genes, which will screw up your mitochondria and you'll have that non-restorative sleep. So I would encourage anyone who has brain fog or these sort of issues, get your hormones checked. If you're a male, make sure your testosterone is not in your boots. Women going into menopause, you may want to consider estrogen. There's a whole bunch of benefits that a woman with mitochondrial disease would even derive more benefits. It screws up your sleep. It gives you hot flashes and then you're gonna have secondary issues. Um, you know, optimize your sleep. It's just such an important component, which you know, I didn't really talk about, but that really is such a critical thing that most people you know, don't even think of as real medicine, but it's a huge new discipline of medicine. And, and it's probably the, the one area that's best linked to mitochondrial function through these new things called clock genes that they've discovered. So I'd really encourage people to focus on that. Uh, but again, don't get discouraged. Um, you know, everyone's got that threshold. Like we have, SMA patients, you can barely lift their arm up and, you know, they're going to the gym and they're working out and they come back and say, oh my God, I'm so much better. It's, uh, but it takes a long time. What is currently the best biomarker for mitofunction? The, um, they wrote citrate synthase biopsy, GDF-15. Is there something else? Is there? Yeah. Bottom line is we only use markers for diagnosis or clinical trials, right? There's no value. And, you know, um, I don't even bother measuring who gives a rat's arse, you know, what their lactate is when my patients come in with Mila syndrome. So, you know, all these doctors measure all this stuff, but what do you do with the data? What I care about when patients come in is, are you becoming diabetic? Um, if you're really tired, what's your thyroid? Have you become hypothyroid? I mean, you know, because everyone just puts it off and says it's a mitochondrial disease, but if you're flipping hypothyroid, it's going to just trash you. And it's such a treatable entity. So think about everything that's treatable. Check the, the ferritin, you know, but following GDF-15, every time somebody comes into a yearly clinic, 
what are you going to do with that information? You know, it's, it's pretty useless. So we only use it for clinical trials or to make a diagnosis. So a diagnosis, you know, it's history, it's physical examination, uh, lactate, plasma amino acids, urine organic acids. We put all of these together to, you know, get a patient a definitive 100% diagnosis. And then after that, we just follow things that we think are going to change their functional capacity. How for um, how many grams of creatine and protein do you typically recommend for someone who's middle aged to avoid sarcopenia? Yeah, so great question. Um, so uh, Stu Phillips, uh, who's my first postdoc, is you know probably the world expert on protein requirements and aging. And it's pretty clear. People thought I was a heretic in 1988 when I suggested that the protein requirements for people doing activities should be a little higher. Uh, it's now standard of care throughout the world. Um, and so uh, generally in North America, they recommend uh, 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. However, um, it's pretty clear, especially as we age, you need 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram per day. So that's 50% more than what the US government is recommending. And the best way of getting your protein is high quality protein. So that's why in our supplement, that muscle five, we have casein and whey because mother nature is smart. 200 million years of evolution as mammals, what did mother nature choose? Mostly whey with casein. So it's about a 60, 40 ratio. So milk is great. And that's why it has one of the highest biological value. The other thing with high biological value is eggs. Egg whites are incredibly high biological value. Uh, but eating the whole egg actually was shown in one study to even be better than just eating the egg whites. Um, so eggs are great. Milk is great. Fish and meats, you know, we don't want to, you know, rape our world and take all of the meat. But, you know, small portions are very important. Lean cuts, um, you know, sustainable, uh, you know, fish, et cetera, et cetera, are good. Um, plant protein is pretty low biological value. So, um, you know, when we're talking about 1.2 grams per kilogram, that's a mixed diet, which includes good quality protein. If you're a vegan, good luck to you. It's going to be really hard to maintain your muscle mass and you need to have a dietitian and you need to really balance it and be very, 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 very careful. So the better the quality of the protein, you know, you probably don't need as much, uh, but on average, we'd say 1.2 grams per kilogram per day for creatine. Um, most of our studies and, and, and studies in Paul Greenhoff in 1996 show that three grams per day. So I don't have my creatine with me. We're, we're just measuring it out, but we did some studies here where we measured it out. So one level teaspoon is 2.5 grams of creatine. So if you buy the powder, um, you know, you grab your uh, baking spoons, one level teaspoon is 2.5 grams. So just a slightly heaping spoon gives you your three grams, which is all you need. So uh, just mix that into applesauce, mashed potatoes, whatever. Don't bake with it, because if you bake it, it'll be converted to creatinine, but you can mix it into potatoes or applesauce. Even if it's warm, it's not going to be a problem, but it will settle to the bottom. It will never go into solution. I really appreciate you throwing it in there not to bake with it, because <laughs> it's good to have those clarifications of how, when we cook with things, how it changes. The, um... oh, it totally destroys it, yeah. Um, so in regards to the protein, you did mention that it, that, um, as you get older, you have anabolic resistance toward protein. Um, so can you explain like what happens then like to the protein that you consume because you want to increase your protein, but your body's not using it as well. Yeah. Can you explain Good that point. just a little bit? Yeah. So in a young person following exercise, if you take 20 grams of uh, protein, you'll stimulate protein synthesis. So you'll grow more muscle. For an older adult, you need about 30 grams to get the same bang for your buck. So um, bottom line is you just need a little bit more, which is why young people can still build muscle, um, you know, even if they're skimping on their protein, you know, at 0 0.8 or 1.0. Uh, but an older adult, you really have to just have more on board. The other thing too, which Stu emphasizes, and I agree with him based on the research, is, you know, it's that breakfast and lunch that many people skimp or they have almost no protein. And so they're getting one bolus at the end of the day. So having, uh, you know, um, 20 to 30% of your protein with breakfast, 20 to 30% with lunch, and then, you know, the 40 to 50 with, uh, with dinner is, is, uh, is an important way to try and balance out the protein. And again, good quality protein, uh, the ones that I've listed are, are, and that's why we came up with this supplement you know, I'm not trying to push supplements, but for some people, it is a challenge. Uh, I know myself when I'm traveling to, you know, get good quality food. Uh, and it's, you know, so easy every morning. I just take, you know, 20 grams of uh, whey and casein because you know, I have my cereal with some milk, 
but that's not quite enough. So now that I'm an old guy, um, I take a half a scoop of, you know, which is 20 grams of protein. I just mix into my coffee and poof, it's down in two seconds flat. And there's my good quality protein. Well, we have so many more questions, but I know that um, your time is precious, Dr. Trumpolsky. I'm just going to ask one more question sure. and then um, please know that I will try to note all of the questions that are in the Q&A oh, if you great. wrote a question. I just, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just saw one come up that's very okay. relevant. So yes, what go for it. dairy free? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, dairy free and lactose free are two very different entities. So lactose intolerance is quite common in Caucasians, myself included. When I was uh, traveling to Italy, I got a bad bug and I wiped out all my intestinal flora and I've been wickedly lactose intolerant ever since. Too much information. But yeah, my point is that I cannot even tolerate one creamer in a cup of coffee or I'm gonna be on the toilet, it's horrible, um, which many Caucasians are like that. And actually um, even more so if you're dark skinned. So it's even more common to be lactose intolerant if you're from South Asia, um, I'm not sure about uh, China, but anyhow, it doesn't matter. A lot of people are lactose intolerant. So protein powders, if it is good quality, it's uh, called a whey isolate. So the protein is pulled out of the milk. And uh, I can't speak to other ones, but the protein that we buy, which is the most expensive and the best in the world from New Zealand, uh, it has less lactose than lactose-free milk. So the problem is people look and they say, oh, Mark, you guys have milk protein. This is gonna make me fart. I've got lactose intolerance. It's because they don't know. It's just illogical. There's less lactose in a proper uh, soy, uh, sorry, a proper isolate of, uh, of milk protein. Now, if you have poor quality stuff, there can be some residual lactose in it. Um, uh, now, the other is dairy-free. I don't know what that means because there's a lot of hand-waving. Most people who think they're dairy-free are lactose intolerant. True milk protein uh, allergy is extremely rare pediatric condition uh, where you get an um, inflammation of the gut with true eosinophils. That's extremely rare. Um, so yeah, so definitely good quality protein that is an isolate so that you've uh, gotten rid of the lactose is probably the best way to do it. But even still, every, whenever you eat something new, your microbiome changes. So it takes you a while to get used to it. So don't just jump in with a full dose of uh, whatever supplement or change in your diet, ease into it, just like you'd ease into exercise and get your, your microbiome used to it. Is there any other question that you'd like to take on before we go? I don't want to put you in a, a bind, but you caught that one and I just wasn't sure. I just, I just else popped up and I said, oh my God, that's a good one because it's, it's one of the biggest myths in the world. It's sort of like- No, it's great. Yeah, no, I did not know that. It's like creating um, damage your kidneys, you know, it's such garbage. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Trenopolsky. We really, really appreciate your time. And I hope we can do this again soon because we, we always learn so much when you come and there's always such fabulous questions and people are super excited to hear you. And I just thank you so much for all of your hard work and everything that you do um, for our community. And um, there's just not much more else I can say. We're just wonderful and we really, really appreciate you. So oh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much. It's my pleasure. It's a, a great community and I'm happy to be part of it for the last 30 years and uh, hopefully for the next uh, five or so before I retire. <laughs> All right. Well, until next time and um, next month again, we will have another expert series and we look forward to seeing everyone soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.